Hello, writers. Have you ever bought a writing craft book someone says you just have to read? Is it still sitting on your shelf? Have you even cracked the spine? That's totally me. Don't ask Renee how many craft books she owns. Why do we keep buying these books we never read? We all want to improve as writers, but that's hard to do alone. That's why we started the Words to Write By podcast, to tackle these books together, chapter by chapter, and learn from their advice. Or not. Sometimes they're wrong. Hi, I'm Renee Nelson, former college writing instructor turned full-time writer and podcaster. After many years, I finally have a complete draft of my memoir. And I'm Kim Smuga Otto, author of the humorous fantasy series Boy Bands and Dragons. The first book, Our Comeback Tour Slaying Monsters, will be released this year by Riverfolk Publishing. And now, on with the podcast. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Words to Write By. This is one of our workshop episodes. Uh, just a little reminder, uh, you've got another week to read halfway through Kaiju Preservation Society. Yes, have you started? Uh, no, I'm still waiting for the book to show up in my mail. Okay. But I might have to download it because I need to start reading it because i only got a week left. Yeah, definitely. It's a quick read though, right? It's a very quick read. Yeah. And I've got my book club book, but I'm not enjoying it that much, so... I might just abandon it. It's the yeah. thing I do. Anyway, today we are doing a workshop of Kim's book. Are we doing your first book or that's about to be published? I think we should. Yeah, I think that's the one we'll go from. Because you've read that one. Yeah. Yeah. We have been covering the archetypes in Vogler's book, The Writer's Journey. And Renee, can you name all the architects? Uh, oh, architects? boy. So I'm not going to look at my show notes and I'm not looking at the book. Let's see if I can do it. we got the hero. We've got the mentor, we have the threshold guardian, we have the ally, we have, oh boy, I'm starting to lose it. Uh, we have a shapeshifter, we have the herald, we have the trickster, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm losing the rest of them. I, There's only one more to go. <gasps> is there really? Oh crud, what is it? The shapeshifter, the herald, the, you'll have to cut all this out, I mean like thinking out loud. Um... I'm thinking of them. I've written about them extensively. Grr. I don't remember. The shadow. Damn it. <laughs> Damn it. The last one we just did. Yeah. Uh. But you got all the rest. I was really impressed. Thank you. So our workshop today is to look at my book and identify what some of the characters are. Specifically, I was thinking it would just be fun to take the boy band characters and just look at them because um, when I wrote about them, I started by assigning them a stereotype, a boy band stereotype. And when they go to the magical world, they all get classes. And so they also then have all the class stereotypes that go with it. And I'm wondering if mm. all that stuff together actually makes an archetype or how that, this is another layer, you know. And then right. on top of all that, there's the archetype role they play in the story. Wait a minute. So you have a boy band archetype. Yes. Right? Each each member in a boy band has their own archetype well, of being a boy band. There is, right? They have a stereotype, yes. Yeah, they're a stereotype. Okay. They might also be archetypes because they're in a hero's journey in a way, right? Right. Okay. So first, can you give us a quick synopsis of your book or your story? So the premise, the book starts off with the boy band, Never Boyland, getting back together. They've been rehearsing a little bit, but they are just about ready to re uh, to have a comeback. What was their story like? What, or is it is that okay to talk about like their well, they, origin they story? They, they broke up a few years back, and now they're back together again. Okay. And the main character is Kyle, who, when the band broke up, did not stay in show business, but actually went and got a college degree. He's rejoining the band, and this there there are other boy bands that have had you know members that when the boy band broke up. Like there was, uh, I think the boys to men, like one of the guys ended up being an accountant. So nice. So there's they're, they're setups for that. And then he comes back and they are going to rehearse a performance. They're going to do a virtual reality performance in a video game. And when they put on the headsets, instead of being in the VR space, they are magically teleported to the fantasy world, at which point they are informed that they are the new heroes that have been brought in by the divine wisdom to fulfill some quest. Nobody knows quite what it is. And at that point, they all receive their D&D &D classes. Okay. 
I'm kind of curious, what kind of research did you do to figure out the stereotype of the boy band? Because believe it or not, I was never a boy band person. I wasn't into them. I remember when I was like nine, New Kids on the Block came out. And the friends that I had, that they talked about them all the time and they knew all the names of these people. And I didn't know who they were. But I did get a poster eventually because I'm like, well, I want to fit in, right? Mm-hmm. All I remember is the name Donnie. Mm-hmm. And then I learned later that Marky Mark, Mark Wahlberg, is Donnie's brother. Right. And he almost ended up in the... I almost was, ended up in the band. I had no idea there was a connection. Anyway... So I'm curious, what kind of research did you do? And please go through the stereotypes of the members of a boy band. Oh, she's getting the big guns. She's leaving us. I wonder what she's getting. She is returning. So um, I get what you're saying because I also was not into boy bands as a kid. Ah, I was aware of them, but... You know, it was harder to find information out then. What was the popular one when you were a kid? Well, I was New Kid at Zumblock, too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Who was your favorite? See, I, I never got into them. Mm. Later in life, when I was working, I had a coworker who was very into NSYNC. So I had a little bit of the idea of the Backstreet Boys versus NSYNC. And in recent years, you know, I became aware of One Direction, but I never went terribly deep into the boy bands. So when I started writing the story, it was kind of meant to be more of a spoof. And I knew they had stereotypes. And I knew kind of what they were, but I didn't know which band members were which stereotypes. And it was kind of hard to figure it out. And then I found this book, Larger Than Life, A History of Boy Bands from NKOTB to BTS by Maria Sherman. Oh, New Kids on the Block to BTS. But, uh, boys to... No. <laughs> I don't know what is BTS. <laughs> what stop looking at me like that <laughs> boy not not boys to men um back street no it can't be backstreet boys it's i i can't i don't know it's the korean pop band <gasps> okay i was They're never gonna get that bts okay <laughs> it sounds like a kinky thing but i'm not <laughs> bts could i can that could be an acronym for anything okay so you got this book yes and this book Who's it by? Give give him cred. Maria Sherman. All right. Thank you, Maria Sherman. And it is beautifully written. Like, it is just so much fun. It opens up with boy band theory. What is a boy band? And who gets to decide which artists are worthy of the title? Surely a rose by any other name would smell as sweet? If you're clamoring for an expert definition here, you clearly haven't listened to many boy bands in your life. Don't worry. By the end of this, you'll be a pro. Nice. Yeah, it's really well written. One of my favorite wines is... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give us a sample of, of the stereotypes. Mm-hmm. There's the entomology of the boy band, um, and that has the categories. You have the heartthrob. This hunk of man meat is often mistaken for the front band. In some ways, he is, but don't tell that to a boy band. This is meant to be a team effort. The heartthrob is most accurately identified as the playful, cheeky, outgoing, obscenely charming, charming guy who is somehow always photographed in the middle of the group. Ah. Uh, so your <laughs> heartthrob character is Tristan, the blonde, yes. tall, mm-hmm. handsome. He's got substance sheeple and his eyes are up there, not that you've been able to look away. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Timberlake is a um, ah, okay. from uh, NSYNC. Then we have the bad boy. Everyone loves a rebel. And when you're a tween, that means an unintimidating boy band in a leather jacket. He <laughs> looks dangerous, but he'd only cut class if you, girl, really wanted him to. And first period already had leaked the news that Mr. Lockhart had moved the chemistry pop quiz to next week. So you're good. <laughs> nice. So this is the bad boy who wears yeah. the leather jacket. Yeah. He's a softy under all that unbreathable uh... black lead fabric. Okay. And that character in the band is? It's is Kyle. It? No, Kyle's the nerd. Uh, the bad boy. It's the rogue. Yeah. I forget his name. Cole. Cole! The cute one. Not to be <laughs> mistaken for the heartthrob, the cute one is the baby of the group. He's ah. probably the youngest member and internally might be known as the little brother of the band. In White boy bands, he's not always blonde, but also, yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> well, yours is a redhead, right? Mine's a redhead, yes. The only reason I know is because, so she had a lot of art done, came, like, had art made of the boy band, which is freaking fantastic. And I can see them in my head because I've seen pictures of them. And I'm thinking of the short one. 
Yeah. He's shorter than the rest of them, and he's got red hair, and mm-hmm. he's got kind of a mean look, but <laughs> he's nice. Okay. <laughs> so that's Micah. And then we have the responsible one, sometimes referred to as the older brother or the sensible one of the group. The responsible member is the friend who orders seltzer with a lime at the bar to appear like he's drinking when he's not drinking. Ah. The responsible one shows boy band fans that, like a fine wine, (laughs) men can actually get better with age. Nice. (laughs) That one is Oscar. And then finally, the shy one. This category is the most confounded because the shy is actually a generous title, often refers to boy role as quiet, mysterious, or God forbid, the forgotten one, because little is known about him (laughs) compared to the others. The shy guy is intriguing to some fans. Something about the meek mentality is attractive to those drawn to artistic introverts. The shy guy. Yeah. Kyle is technically the shy guy, although I decided to go a little bit different and make him into a nerd. He's the shy guy, he's a nerd, and he's either turned into this or he was always um, snarky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's snarky and he's got sometimes a bad attitude. (laughs) Not always bad, but uh, a sarcasm. He's very sarcastic. Very sarcastic. So anyway, that's that's where I got all the information that I based my book on. So that is the boy band archetype. They are the, I mean, archetype's kind of a weird word, but in a way, archetype is supposed to be this like, thing in your back of your brain that like all people have and the fact is that yes as far as non-threatening guys to have crushes on when you're in your tweens those are kind of the categories right (laughs) right most tweens have these categories i mean they are specifically designed so that each one um uh is a manifestation of one kind of guy a girl will have a crush on what your type might be exactly oh interesting which one would you go for if you if you were into boy bands when you were younger? Wh- who would you have picked? I don't know. I mean, I would. I'm sure I would have gone for Kyle, but like, oh, so you like the shy guys? Yeah, I would totally have gone for the shy guys okay. when I was that age. I mean, now I kind of like Tristan. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, now we're older. We're like, like why go with the shy guy? I want the one with like, <laughs> yeah, the packs. You know, <laughs> woo, aim higher. <laughs> I know Wolverine. <laughs> 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 So, I want them to be contractually obligated to take their shirts. God, that sounds so sexist. Because if it was switched to a, if a guy said, I want them contractually obligated to take off their shirts, it would sound really bad. And I would get very angry. Mm-hmm. But I've seen you at the Renaissance Festival when, oh. the, when the Scottish uh, night comes Scotland! out. Scotland! Oh, yes, I get that picture. <laughs> oh, Dear listener. I mean, part of what makes, <laughs> this is completely the side, but part of what makes a boy band fun, part of what makes like these stars fun is it gives you a chance just to fantasize and just to enjoy right. this and just to revel in it and, and not have it be creepy. That's the trick. It's like, is it creepy? No, it isn't. Because they're almost kids themselves in a way. Well, when they were boy bands, yeah. Yeah, well, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Is mm-hmm. Like the boy bands themselves, when they're doing that stuff, it's not gross that a tween has a crush on them. Right. Because they're almost like cartoon teenagers. Yeah. 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 Interesting. I, I know more about boy bands than I've ever known in my life, and this is one short conversation. I use this information fairly strongly throughout the book. So now we've established they are as characters like in our world. Now, if we're going to apply them to the hero's journey... Well, here's the thing, though. I mean, I wrote this story with them having been these types of boy band members. But at this point in their life, they've this is several years removed. They have changed. They have certain baggage that's attached to them. But like while Micah was the cute one and is still quite cute, I mean, he's not nearly as sweet as he used to be. He's actually kind of snarky and kind of self-centered and rude. (laughs) Right. So like I've advanced them as far as that goes. If you just have characters as archetypes and stories, it's not enjoyable. They aren't very well rounded. They only have a job to do, and that's what they're for. Okay, so let me reframe it. So we have read The Last Unicorn by Peter S. Beagle, and Mm -hmm. we applied that to the hero's journey, whether or not it followed it or not. Mm -hmm. We did the same with Howl's Moving Castle. Mm -hmm. We found characters that would fit the archetypes. They weren't writing to the archetypes and in fact we would argue that some of them really aren't the archetypes we're like this is as close as we can come to right that's the question i'm asking do your characters are there any archetypes that they hit they're coincidentally they seem to have like they seem to be the archetype of the shapeshifter or the hero like is kyle the hero in the first book clearly the hero 
Okay. One thing I did like about the writer's journey, the book we're reading, is they said that an archetype is also a role, a mask that people put on. And so the way my story is designed in the first book, Kyle's the hero. In the second book, Oscar is going to be the hero. And that's going to redefine actually everyone's relationship with the main character because Kyle's relationship with all these people is different than Oscar's relationship with them. So, so Kyle's the hero. And it, he is definitely the hero because he's following a journey. We have him in his world. We have him going to another world. We have him being given a call. We have him answering the call. Like Kyle is clearly the hero because I've given him the hero mantle. One of the fun things is because his role in the boy band is very secondary. He was never very important in the band. He's the least expected person that you would expect to be the hero given the boy band set up, right. which is what makes it fun. It defies expectation. Exactly. It's much more fun to have a hero who no one expects to be a hero. Yeah. Those actually are kind of my favorite. Yeah. I, Underdog and, hero. Obviously, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, and Star Wars, you know, the kid from the backwater planet. Like, in the stories that follow the hero's um, journey, very explicitly, the main hero is somebody that you don't expect to be the hero. Well, it's great for those kinds of characters because that there's a lot of opportunity for growth and your character needs to grow. So it kind of just like hands it to you on a platter there. If they start low, they can go high. They can go high. So, okay. So we've got the hero done. And mm -hmm. then is there a mentor in your story? Yeah, but it wouldn't be in the boy band. Okay. So all of those characters, none of them are just like the mentor. That would be like someone in the world. Right. Because none of the characters have any idea how the world works. In fact, Kyle's one that has, has a better idea than any of the others. That's part of the fun. <gasps> What was her name? Marjorie? Marjorie. Thanks. Marjorie was their agent, right? Mm -hmm. When they were in the real world, she was their mentor. Exactly. But now they're not. So actually, they do kind of have not appearances, but she comes back in terms of like things that she said and, and flashbacks. Mm -hmm. But so she's kind of a mentor, but in that world. And, and it does help. It's almost like they remembered things and they apply her advice later on in the world, right? Right. Didn't um, in the book, didn't uh, Vogler say that your mentor could also be a code right that's right kind of like a, a a western yeah yeah and in my book i have the you do laws have, of boy bands you marjorie have, banks laws of boy bands marjorie banks laws of boy which are hilarious and awesome yes does that make it does that make an appearance in the second one not as much it was very wound into the story line. oh yeah and so i kind of i used it to the full of my uh capacity what was your favorite law <sighs> Well, I don't have them in front of me. Okay. I almost feel like I want a poster of them. <gasps> oh, my God. We should make a poster of them. Yes. Um, there was one about hairspray or something about, like, you can go don't, a long way if as long as your hair looks good or something like that. The, that was a boy band with devotion, determination, great hair, and a bit of luck can do anything. I like that one. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was another one about being nice to people, like be good to your fans in some way. And actually, yeah. I felt like that was like a good one for life. It reminded me of like, you know, if you're on a date and someone's rude to the waiter, that is not a good date. There was also one that the first thing anyone should remember about you was he was so nice. That's the one. <laughs> that's the one. I like that one because that's I can, you could can really apply that to your life. Yeah. <laughs> to think. If there's ever a stranger and you meet them, what you want them to think is... He's so nice. He's so nice or she's so, so nice, nice or they're so nice. Yes. Okay. So we've got the mentor. Okay. The next one, I should just pull up the show notes because I don't remember them in order. What was the next one? So the next one on the list was Threshold Guardian. Again, I think some of these ones don't come into play because all the boy bands are from our world. But well, what is it real quick? The, the real quick review... The Threshold Guardian is the they guard the first gates. person they get in a fight with. Yeah. <laughs> if it's a male-centric story. Yeah. So again, well, at this point, we're in the story itself. Because I bring all five members of the boy band in, they don't play as big a role of bringing Kyle into the story. They're kind of like tag-alongs. His members of his boy band. Yeah. The members of the boy band are actually for plot purposes kind of just allies that come along their greater role is in the emotional arcs that take place mm. i don't think that there's a individual that he has a beef with which would push him further into the world within the band well he has to overcome certain things i would argue that it doesn't always have to be a fight 
Mm -hmm. Some have to do with the love interest, Sophie. Yeah. You, You know, there's some thresholds he has to cross to, like, understand his relationship with her. Okay. So I don't want to spoil things. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, well, so, okay. The Threshold Guardian presents challenges to the hero either through a battle of test or of wit and force the hero must prove their worthiness to continue on the quest. So they do have to do training. Mm-hmm. So there's that. They have to figure out who their divine god is or goddess or whatever that, you know, kind of like is their patron. Well, that was specifically for Oscar, but yeah. Oh, the, the rest of them don't have that. No. Oh, shoot. Okay. I mean, I don't know. Well, there's the cockatrice. I think the cockatrices are kind of the uh, the threshold guardians, the fight with them. But... Yeah. And that dips them really into the world where, like, they can't go back, really. Yeah. Okay. So I guess there's only some threshold guardians, or there's a, the one, and it's where it's supposed to be. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Then there's the herald, the messenger. And it's... remember, we also talked about that there's a second whole hero arc that's going on with, uh, with Sufi's character. So some of these things are, there are other archetypes that directly interact with her in a way that's different than those that interact with Kyle. We're not talking about Sufi as the hero of the story, because there is, if you oh, map right. it out, you can see a whole story arc of Sufi as the hero, and then you have different archetypes interact, then two people take on different archetypes interacting with her. Right. Okay, so the Herald, it's a call for change. It could be within or without. And uh, the archetype provides or triggers the internal motivation for the hero. Mm-hmm. Be it a coincidentally relevant news story your protagonist just happens to be watching, <laughs> to a ring placed in the hand of a tiny hobbit, to a fire demon offering you hope that you can reverse the witch's curse. Um, and it can manifest itself in different forms. So are there heralds in your story? Mm-hmm. Or are any of the boy band's heralds? Well, like I said, the boy bands, because they're from our world, can't be a herald to Kyle in taking him into this world. When they arrive in the world, Sufi's there and she tells them what's going on. I think less. she's the herald. Yeah. No, she's a herald in more ways than one. Okay. Because she has relationships, or she, she, she makes relationship with Kyle, kind of Tristan, and it triggers at least Kyle to be a better person, or at least it triggers emotions within him to make him change as a character. That's what the Herald is supposed to do. Okay. So that's what I think it is. Do you agree? You know, that's the cool thing about having a book that's highly (laughs) written. Everyone's going to get something a little bit different from that. I think it's cool. Okay. Yeah, that you see it that way. I guess, so the problem is the Herald sometimes like just gets the story going. but. I think it's sometimes also just like it helps plot points move. Right. And so I kind of see the Herald as just a very small mask that, you know, just the right person, the right time says the right thing. Right. Okay. So then the next one is the uh, shapeshifter. Ah. Which, you know, you heard my rant in the last episode. So what is the shapeshifter according to this? Uh, according to your notes. Let's see. It's a character whose function in appearance changes quite drastically. You may be saying, like, a werewolf. Sure, why not? Or Kaiser Soze from The Usual Suspects. Or Agatha Harkness from WandaVision. So somebody who it starts out, we think they're this type of character. They're an ally. But later they turn out to be villains. Mm-hmm. Which is a stereotypical one, but that's kind of... Right. In Vogler's book, it was just women in general, you know, when you get pregnant or you were literally on PMS. I'm not joking. He actually said that. When you're having your period, somehow you change drastically, dear female listener, so much so that you become the shapeshifter. I have heard that, you know, PMS is that one time in the month when a woman acts exactly like a man. Really? (laughs) (laughs) You know, that would explain some things. Anyway, in the book... I have been thinking about this, and within the boy band, there is a shapeshifter. Okay. I think I know who you're talking about, but I, okay. for in case I'm wrong, can you can you reveal? No, no, no. I, it's more fun for you to guess. Well, the dryad, you know, she was one way, but we learn that there's a deeper, like, she's part of a deeper plot. Right, but within the band itself. That someone else turned out to be someone that they weren't? hmm Well, Kyle, but not really. I mean, he grew as a character, um, the bad guy, or not bad guy, sorry, the rogue, he got a little darker. Tristan. Because when the book starts, Kyle has some very specific ideas of who he thinks Tristan is. And 
that Tristan, you know, has become the superstar. And, you know, he helped Kyle along because he felt guilty or pitied Kyle all this time. And then at a certain point, it's discovered that, no, in fact, Tristan doesn't feel that way about Kyle. And it's a big difference. It one of the things that he's kind of part of his core identity is the idea that, you know, Tristan has gone on and become this famous person that doesn't need him anymore, but then discovers that actually Tristan does want him as a friend. Yeah. So it's interesting because that is more of a, a perception of somebody. Yeah. That's, I've always liked that aspect of the shapeshifter far more than a, a plot point. Yeah. That's great. It's not stereotypical at all. At all. Like it's an internal change because Tristan really hasn't changed. He's always loved Kyle. <laughs> yeah. It's how Kyle feels about him that has changed. It's or, yeah, Kyle's or the, perception of the character. Kyle's always been a really good friend to Tristan. It's the perception in Kyle's mind about how Tristan feels about him. Right. Then we got to the shadow. Okay. So the shadow. Um, well, I don't write evil characters in my book. Like there's no character in the book that really is like evil, evil. So there's no villains, but there's plenty of antagonists. Right. People who are wrong. (laughs) Right. There is an effect going on in the world, and there is a reason for it. So they do have to overcome, like, a big bad. Yes, there is a big bad. However, there isn't a bad guy in that sense. Right. There isn't someone, like, pulling the strings going, Yes. Yes. In fact, at one point, you know, Kyle's like looking around at the other people around, the various people that are interacting and commenting that, you know, by all accounts, there should be like a, a villain. And, you know, maybe this character Dryden is like is secretly out to get them. But if he was secretly out to get to them, wouldn't he like be nice to them or something? <laughs> right. You know, Dryden does get the band into a dangerous situation. There's, there's a shadow there. I mean, the boy band character that most likely would have a shadow would be Cole. He has a much darker side. And that will be something that actually plays into the next book because the next book will feature Oscar as the main character and his interactions with the other band members are different than Kyle's. Whereas Kyle's strongest relationship was with Tristan, his childhood friend, Oscar has different sorts of relationships and Cole is actually a very strong relationship for him and Cole's dark side very much affects Oscar. That will be explored in the next book. Okay. Then we have ally. And then we have ally. Everyone's an ally to each other. I mean, it's a boy bands. That's what they are, is a group of allies, right? Exactly. And that's part of the reveal that they are a group of allies. Because a lot of the book, they spend bickering and not getting along. Oh, that's interesting. Right. So that's a play on the ally, right? Like, they were marketed to be allies. They kind of were when they were... Teenagers. Teenagers being a boy band. But then they, they're no longer a boy band, and they aged. And then they came back, and they've... You know, there's all sorts of little demons that followed them and manifested while they were... Right. I mean, you grow up. You're not the person you are as a kid. And, you know, the relationships you had as a kid, those people have changed too. And to expect that it would all just fall back into place would be like, you know, a fantasy, which I wrote. Right. So there is a moment when they all come back together again and they are all allies. Yes. And they have a fighting force (laughs) of doom. They become Voltron. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Well, we all expect that, but it's also a play on the allies. So that's actually really cool. They make allies also in the world. Yes. You know, Sophie Mm -hmm. and her uncle Mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah. And in the end, the whole town really likes them. Right. Because they're the heroes of Bidlow. And they get a plate. They get a plate and have a concert. By plate, we don't mean plate armor. We mean like an actual plate you hang on your wall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes. Like old lady yeah. plate. She, Kim had one made. I'm going to get one. <laughs> and then we have the trickster. Right, which is just random craziness. They cause chaos and they rarely change. They're usually the catalyst for change, right? Right. Mm. Um, Maybe you don't have a... Well, the druid is a bit of a catalyst for change he has they they get a message from him at a certain point that leads them along um the raccoon (laughs) they do tend to manifest in disney they always have the the trickster tends to be an animal sidekick right the trickster is the one that often can speak the truth in a particular way or can reveal stuff so yeah i don't know if you have a trickster maybe you should put one in your next book maybe I think the raccoon would be the trickster, even though he's only in a short part of the book. Yeah, I was going to put him into a later part of the book, and I realized there's too many damn characters, so I left him back in Bidlow. Really? Yeah. Oh, oh, what about Tinkerbell? Tinkerbell. There's a 
familiar. But she doesn't cause chaos, does she? She's just cute. I guess comic relief, which the trickster can also provide. Right, but I think comic relief is its own archetype right there. I mean, the, the trickster does provide comedy. or the, Sorry, the trickster often will, after serious, can bring some comic relief and drop the tension through words and stuff. I mean, Sufi's a little bit of a trickster. She opens the portal for the for the heroes, and that's true. She is a bit of a chaos ma- machine. Yeah, <laughs> her magic is chaotic. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's revealed uh, at a certain point that it was her comments previous to the whole story starting out. She had another group of friends, and it was her comments made on a night when they all wished upon a star or saw a falling star and made wishes that caused them all to go their separate ways because she said something that was like, you know, if you have your dreams, you should follow them, and they all follow their dreams away from each other. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I think that's a going through my book. And, I mean, I find that too much dissection of archetypes, first of all, reveals way too much, and I don't want to reveal everything. But also, if you look, you can find archetypes in everything, and you could, you know, write whole papers on this kind of stuff versus just chatting about it. Right, right. Literary analysis and all that stuff. Do you think this discussion, like talking about the archetypes, do you think they're actually helpful at all? Like, will they help you with your second book now that you're aware of them? I don't think so. I mean, maybe if I'm in an issue or I'm having problems, but a lot of what the archetypes do is functional issues. Like, it's pretty obvious. Like, well, maybe I need to get this character to know something's happening. So I'll need someone to tell him that so we can move ahead. Or maybe I'll need to have... Uh, some comic relief here so maybe I can draw this character in and make them be the comic relief right but other ones like the really interesting ones like having Tristan be the shapeshifter and that whole thing that's that doesn't come from archetypes that comes from like something deeper in your mind when you're writing right cool well I'm excited for your book to come out in September right launch date yet nope not yet but hopefully soon hopefully soon all right all right well this was fun yeah I love talking about boy bands with you Kim (laughs) And other things you never thought you'd say. I never thought I'd say that in my life. You are correct. Never yeah. thought. Anyway, all right. Before we go, just remember that we have process groups on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. We alternate. We either do a writing sprint where Renee gives a tiny little like five-minute lesson and then we just write for two hours. Or we have a process group where we get together and people just talk about issues they're having as writers or things they want to talk about as writers or things that they've been talking to their family and friends and the friends there don't want to talk about it anymore. And so they bring it to the process group. You can find the links to that through Meetup um, or on our website. Yep. Words to write by podcast.com. All right. You guys take care. Have a good week. Bye. Bye. Words to write by is produced by Renee Nelson and Kim smith Adam. Our theme music is Roll Back the Carpet by Cool Cat Music. Have a great day. Um, you should just cut that out. I hope it was informative. Your face. Uh, <laughs> your face is informative. <laughs>